So good morning, everybody. Uh, so we were uh, somewhere here yesterday. We were discussing LGN, which is the kind of a midway point between eyes, the other retina, and the visual cortex. So we were discussing that there are uh, uh, the six layers on each each side of LGN, and you have this in you know, a complicated connectivity from the retina to the LGN. And in LGN also, you have this uh, center around uh, cells. Cells which have on center off surround or off center on surround kind of receptive fields. And here also there's a segregation of magnocellular layers uh, and paracellular layers because I was telling you yesterday that there are these uh, ganglion cells which have small cell bodies or large cell bodies. And the outputs of these two cell types are slightly segregated, right? And the segregation is maintained even when you go to LGN. Uh, so the so the uh, the m uh, the magnocellular layers right uh, project the fibers of these layers are called the m pathways so these are the uh, fibers which convey information related to motion the mo moving images or motion in the image then uh, the p pathways which are the fibers coming out of the p cells right in uh, in paracellular layers of lgn right these are in, in charge of uh, fine structure analysis and color vision, right? Because basically at the level of retina, cones take care of color and the rods take care of just night vision or the rods are also good at, uh, you know, motion sensitivity. So so that kind of segregation which starts at photoreceptor level uh, kind of gets carried over even uh, in higher layers, right? And you have, if you go to all the way to visual cortex, you'll have specialized cortical areas for processing color, for processing motion and things like that. So, okay, so this is how the segregation works at the level of LGN. And another thing about LGN is only 10 to 20% of inputs to LGN are from retina. So that means if uh, this is your retina, right, and this is LGN, so you have fibers coming from retina to LGN. Only 10 to 20% of it, so this is LGN. Is it comes from uh, the retina. So where does the rest come? Because we thought this is the whole thing. This is the optic now. Okay, so this is, we thought this is the whole thing. But a big part of input to the retina comes by feedback from the visual cortex. Okay, so, so, the, so, the, so the feed thought information from LGN uh, to V1 is much less than the feedback information that comes from V1 to LGN. So this is a very important feature of a visual system. So I want you to constantly look at whatever the data we are presenting about visual system and compare it with CNN, uh, just to see how different visual system is, or where there are similarities. It's good to have that kind of a, good to contrast the two systems, the two approaches. So, uh, so LGN, uh, you can see that because of the presence of the center surround receptor fields, it enhances contrast. So we have seen a simple simulation yesterday, why uh, your center surround receptive fields enhance contrast. It organizes information in the sense it separates information. So, you know, fibers which uh, convey color, fibers which convey motion, all that is segregated. And another thing that happens in LGN is it modulates the level of processing with arousal. So, so the thing is, uh, so you have a retina and LGN. The LGN, as you know, is a part of thalamus. Then there is another uh, brain region called a reticular activating system or RAS, right? This projects to thalamus. So it, it generally sets the overall activity levels, right? Uh, of, of, via thalamus, it sets the activity levels of the cortex. Okay, so that is uh, what is called arousal. So for example, in your uh, waking state, you know, your cortex is not that active. I mean, there's no sensory perception and things like that, unless you're in dream state. So and uh, sorry in your in your uh, sleeping in your uh, sleep state, right? Unless you are dreaming, there's not much of there's no sensory perception. Okay, so arousal levels are low. Okay, and that is controlled by the RAS uh, signals going to LGN and through through not to LGN to thalamus in general, and uh, through that uh, it controls uh, the cortex. So, uh, so that kind of modulation occurs uh, you know, also in LGN because LGN is a place where, through which right, the RIS controls the arousal levels of the cortex. Then it also receives feedback from higher, higher areas, uh, V1. So this is something that is missing in a CNN model because it's a feed-forward network. 
there no feedback loops but in a deep network you can generally have you can definitely have uh, feedback connections of all sorts you want but this is a very important feature of uh, visual system with uh, a very large feedback coming from visual cortex to thalamus now just to have an idea of uh, how much information is present in in lgn uh, this group did an interesting study way back in 1999 in this journal of neuroscience paper so they have presented the uh, black and white videos to a cat right and then recorded from cat selgian cells they have taken 177 selgian cells in in the cat and uh, they have taken several pairs of uh, on center off center and off center on center kinds of cells um, so using that so so you they present an image and get the responses right and uh, so these are the receptive fields of uh, so if this is the image that they are presenting okay so this square right and uh, so these uh, ellipses are the centers or the receptive fields of various cells from which they are recording so given the image they could have the cell response and then they have, then they inverted the problem right so so image uh, to cell response and they, so you can we have this uh, recordings and then you build a model of the reverse mapping given the cell response what will be the image can you estimate the image so that's what they have done i'm not going to go into the methods of it's not very important but i just want to show uh, how it is how much information is present in lgn so from if the in the figure b uh, so e, e, this upper panel is original and this is the reconstruction so this is uh, original okay so it, it looks like a fairly reasonable uh, you know replica of the original so here this is slightly bad because there's a lot of which uh, details in the original image and third one is slightly bad but other two are reasonably good so it also shows uh, how well we understand the neural code uh, of the signals present in various visual areas but now technology is a lot better i mean you can even take eeg and uh, classify the patterns that the subject is looking at so there's a lot more uh, things have moved on further on uh, now compared is compared to this 99 paper okay then let us go to the visual cortex so this is the primary stopover uh, in the, the cortical stopover of the visual signals so from retina right you go to lgn and from there you go to p1 and primary visual cortex uh, so there is a kind of interesting mapping between visual field and the primary visual cortex so this doesn't always happen i mean the a simple mapping from sensory stimulus to neurons in a cortical area that doesn't happen all the time that happens mostly in primary sensory areas beyond that the mapping is very complicated you don't have this kind of simplistic point to point mapping so which is what happens here so this is the visual field right if a given point if you present a dot like a light light dot uh, somewhere in the visual field you will find that that activates a very small set of neurons a very localized set of neurons in the visual cortex now if you shine the dot in a slightly uh, nearby location right you will activate the nearby neurons in the visual cortex so there is a, almost like a point to point continuous map between uh, visual field and uh, you know primary visual cortex so uh, so th- to understand how that map works people have done an interesting experiment so they have presented the uh, you know flashed pictures like this right in front of this was a lot of this work was done on primates right in monkeys so you have this uh, uh, bunch of concentric circles with radial lines these are radial lines and these are the concentric circles um, and these are presented to the animal and uh, the head is fixed so eyes are also fixed and uh, you record from uh, the, the the visual cortex so what they do is uh, they inject uh, radioactive glucose uh, into the into the blood so so that is picked up by neurons and when neurons are active they pick up more more glucose right and uh, so the so that since it's radioactive it releases some radiation so by picking up the radiation right from that cortical area from v1 you can get a picture of which neurons are active the patterns in which the neurons are active so those patterns look like this so you see the picture on the left this is the uh, kind of a pattern of active neurons when you present that kind of a bar when present kind of a concentric circle pattern 
So epsilon uh, is uh, called eccentricity. It's like radius, basically, r. And uh, the a is azimuth. It is like the angle. So basically, it's a polar plot. So it has r and theta. So instead of r and theta, they use notation epsilon and a. So see how the r and theta are mapped in this in the, in the cortex. So r has become so like, x-axis, right? So this is uh, how r is changing. Here epsilon is. Uh, one degree, epsilon is 2.5 degrees and five degrees and so on and so forth. And uh, the ang the theta or the angle, right, is uh, is this. So at this point, it is minus 90. At this point, it is plus 90. So if you want various other angles, you should take arcs like this. Okay, so the, so the central line is zero degrees and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of very strange nonlinear transformation of the input data. So that is, uh, in fact, people have found that if you express your position, right, if you take the position on the in, in the visual field, x, x, y, you can also write it as r theta. So you can write this as uh, in complex variable form, right? You can write it as x plus i, y, or r into e power i theta. So it turns out that the mapping that you see here can be very well approximated by something like epsilon is equal to some lambda times ln. Uh, and let me check uh, minus uh, ln some mu times uh, z. Uh, I think there is a mark. Okay, so, so this is how it looks. Um, so there's a, a complex log map between the visual field and the response of neurons in the, in the primary visual cortex. Now you'll be wondering why would biology or why would nature come with that kind of a very complicated, sophisticated, right? This is a logarithmic map is fine, but it's a log map in, in, the, in the complex space. Why would it come up with something like that? So it turns out that this kind of a mapping is very, is commonly used in pattern recognition like literature, right? To come up with uh, methods of recognition which are scale invariant. Okay, and why is that? So take, for example, complex log of uh, of the input in the polar form, R in P for right theta. And that gives you ln R plus I theta. Okay, so you see that the side of you can see that the R value has become x-axis, right, in the output, and the angle has become y-axis, i theta. So which is what what is roughly, which is what you see here. And when you do that, scaling means R, right? When you, if you want to expand the input image, you have to multiply in the this number with some scalar value, uh, a scalar real value. So that becomes uh, a factor of R. So it simply becomes an addition to, so, so suppose I take ln of uh, A R times C to the I theta. That simply gives me ln A plus ln R plus I theta. So basically when you scale the in input image, you are just adding a constant to, to the previous value. So that's simply translation. So scaling simply becomes translation in this kind of a log, uh, complex log transformation. And once, so translation can be easily handled. So so you can easily uh, transform the original scaled image into something st some standard size uh, because it's easy to handle the translation. Okay, so it's a very convenient tool, convenient transformation that uh, you, can, you can use uh, to do scale invariant pattern recognition. Uh, now the question is, is biology using this log map in that fashion? Is it using for that purpose? We don't know. But it's a very good guess because this is a standard feature, the standard trick that you use in pattern, in pattern recognition uh, to do scale invariant uh, recognition. So this mapping from visual field to the visual cortex is called retinotopic map. Retino is retina and topic is to topos is space. So it's retina space is mapped onto visual cortex. <coughs> so, uh, so then after uh, that, that retinotopic map basically tells you how 
points in the visual field are mapped onto points in the visual cortex okay now let us look at the response of single neurons in v1 so we have seen that uh, in both retina so in ganglion cells uh, you have responses uh, to simple dots because the since the receptive fields are structurally symmetric they only respond to you know circularly symmetric patterns which is like a dot or a small circle a small disk but when you go to v1 v1 neurons uh, you know people have found that they don't really respond to dots so when the this uh, hubel and weiser who did pioneering work on v1 neuron responses so when they worked in harvard harvard in the 60s they were surprised to find that they don't respond to dots at all they presented all kinds of dots big dots small dots light ones with the dark background and vice versa and so on but there was no response then accidentally uh, somebody in their group has found that uh, when you present a bar instead of a dot right neurons respond and they also respond to only when you present a bar of a given orientation if you change the orientation again the response goes away okay so uh, that was a very big finding at the time and this people got a nobel prize for not only for this but a lot of other things that they have done uh, in in vision research so there are these cells which respond to oriented features oriented bars and uh, they are called the simple cells uh, the simplest of them are called the simple simple cells these kinds of cells respond to oriented line present in the center of the receptive field so in the case of simple cells if this is a receptive field they respond only when the bar is present when bar goes to the center then you have complex cells uh, which respond to a bar of a given orientation but it doesn't have to be in the center only it can be here or here or here it does more more leeway more flexibility then you have another kind of cell called end stopping cell which fires when so in this case the line is going through the edge or the bar is going through the receptor field cutting across in case of end stopping the edge or the line stops somewhere inside the receptor field okay so so basically all these neurons are tuned to not to dots but to line like features so people have speculated how do you get that in order to get this kind of orientation sensitivity because in lgn you have only cells that respond to dots these are the kinds of receptive fields that you have in lgn but in moment you go to b1 you have neurons which respond to bars right so people said uh, kind of speculated that uh, if you take a bunch of neurons which respond to dots like this right and uh, imagine this three this three neurons here 1 2 3 Uh, have the three receptive fields as you can see on the left right now if you combine these three neurons uh, and uh, have some kind of a right uh, you control the weights and thresholds so such that this neuron here responds only when all the three neurons 1 2 3 you know, respond simultaneously okay so that will happen only when you have like a bar going through all these guys okay so so that's the idea, intuitive idea so that's how you can construct a neuron which is orientation sensitive by combining the outputs of neurons which are only uh, which have say circularly symmetric receptive fields or dot sensitive you can say they are dot sensitive but the point is you don't have to come up with such simplistic stories so you can easily achieve orientation, orientation sensitivity uh, as we'll see in a, in a minute so this schematic shows how these kinds of recordings are done and how the response changes uh, response of even neurons change as a function of the input stimulus so in this schematic uh, so you're recording from a v1 neuron uh, the setup looks like this now so these are micro electrodes which are capable of recording from a single cell so they penetrate a single neuron and record from there and in the input test stimulus on the screen you show a bar Uh, so in this uh, picture here in this point you have a horizontal bar and there is no response so this uh, black line here indicates the time during which the input stimulus is presented so now you change the stimulus angle slightly and it is now uh, i don't know something like 170 degrees or something like that right and uh, still there is no response you can just see one spike but that's all so increase the angle further and the slightly more spiking now the bar is almost vertical there is some spiking you can see now it's totally vertical you see a lot of spiking all right and then you increase the angle further right uh, so there is uh, again it slowed down 
Okay, again, there's no spiking here, no spiking here. So it looks like this uh, neuron is sensitive to vertical bars to 90 degrees, right? And uh, as you move away from 90, uh, there's lesser firing. In fact, you can see people draw this uh, orientation tuning curves, which looks something like this. So in this case, for example, it is in this 90 degrees and this is firing rate. Okay, as you deviate from 90 degrees, it falls off. And people found that uh, this can be variable approximated by a function like cos of theta minus theta naught. Theta naught is direction to which you are tuned. That is theta is your uh, actual, actual angle. Because the response can be very well approximated by this kind of function. Now, so just like people have probed the kinds of stimuli with which people have probed the uh, ganglion cells and LGN neurons, if you show a dot pattern, there is very little response. Dot pattern in the center, dot pattern in the surround, all over, light all over the place, it doesn't matter. Those kinds of features don't elicit much response in V1 neurons. So also it can be a bar like this. And here again, the white bar with black background or a black bar with a white background. Or it can be an edge like this. You know, edge again, have, we have two kinds, uh, black on one side, white on the other, and vice versa. So these are the kinds of features which elicit response in B1. Okay, so uh, yeah, now this is another schematic uh, that explains, uh, tries to argue how complex cells can evolve, right? If we have several simple cells, uh, which respond only when the uh, bar is in the center, right, uh, of the receptor, the receptive field. You combine several of them, which are next to each other, right, and then in, in, and connect them in this fashion such that uh, this neuron, the orange colored one, will respond if any of the input neurons fire. So it's like more like an R relationship. Then the orange neuron will show complex cell receptive, receptive fields or complex cell type of responses because, uh, so this one will fire when the, uh, so, so suppose you have several cells, this, uh, oh, sorry, okay. Okay, each of them fires when the bar is in the, in the center of it, right? But uh, if you look at this whole bigger receptive field, right? And uh, if this neuron responds to this larger receptive field, then it will fire whenever, you know, no matter where the body is within the receptive field, you should have the correct orientation. So you can, you know, you can conceptually construct and explain how complex cells work using this kind of schematics. But there is no guarantee that is exactly how complex cells work in the real brain, but this is just a schematic. The point is you can produce orientation sensitivity in a much more natural fashion, even in a CNN, right? In a CNN, if you, uh, turn it on some image pattern recognition problem and uh, just look at the responses of uh, the neurons in the first hidden layer and look at the weight patterns. You'll very often see a response like this. So these are uh, uh, orientation sensitive cells. Not all of them, but for this is looking, this is responsive to a vertical bar, uh, right? This is at a 45 degrees and so on and so forth. So orientation comes very naturally. You don't have to come up with uh, complicated schemes to explain why it comes. It comes naturally as a result of the learning. Okay, so we have seen that neurons in V1 respond to orientation. Now, the, obviously uh, all neurons cannot be responding to the same orientation. That then, if that is the case, then we'll never be able to understand this rich visual world where you see all possible orientations. So there must be different neurons responding to different, different orientations. Now the question is, how are these different neurons which respond to different orientations organized in V1? So to understand that, they started probing uh, V1 uh, using again micro electrodes. And uh, so the thing is that two, two ways you can probe. You can probe, so this is a cortical area slab like of six layers. You can probe it vertically, you can probe it horizontally. When they probed the visual cortex V1 vertically uh, and uh, looked at the response properties of neurons at different depths, they found that all the new neurons at a given depth roughly respond to the same orientation. So that's what is shown here. 
in some parts there is not much orientation sensitivity so look at this okay but otherwise uh, more or less wherever there is response in a in a depth yeah, right along the depth uh, neurons respond to the same orientation so therefore they call this this kind of a thing a column because within a column of cells right you have the same orientation uh, so therefore such a column is called an orientation uh, orientation column okay and that kind of organization of orientation response is called columnar organization right of an orientation sensitivity so that is how things are when you probe the cortex in the depth and depth dimension now what happens when you probe the cortex in horizontal direction so for that uh, they probed it with uh, an electrode uh, so they kept probing a a line of neurons right in the horizontal direction direction parallel to the surface and there they found something interesting So suppose this neuron is responsive to a horizontal bar. If you go further, so it is the orientation is decreasing, right, and decreasing progressively in small steps. And as you go to somewhere around here, neurons are responding to vertical bars, right, and you go further down again, neurons are responding to horizontal bars. So over this interval, starting from here to here, you have neurons that respond to all possible orientations. It's like a full suite of orientations are covered. by the small stretch of neurons which is very interesting that means there is a continuous mapping uh, between orientation angle theta and uh, this cortical space right now the thing is this is easy to understand because we are only looking at one dimensions but cortex is a surface so it has two dimensions so how is the angle or orientation mapped on the two dimensions so for that they have uh, done certain optical imaging and uh, let's not go into the methods but what they found is so what we are looking at is at every point in the visual cortex there are neurons which respond to some orientation theta so that means that theta is a function of the position on the cortex that is xy so this is a 2d function right so the height of the function is theta and uh, you know uh, and you are plotting it as a function of x and y how does that orientation look how do, right what is a uh, uh this what does this plot look like so this is what this colored picture on this slide indicates uh, how this orientation changes so the or different orientation values are given different colors this is simple color coding so for example you see that uh, the yellow is like orientation of about 45 degrees uh red seems to indicate orientation of 0 degrees and uh, deep blue seems to indicate orientation of 135 degrees and so on so forth. so you get an idea green seems to be for verticals so what you find is it's not a totally smooth uh, you know variation like a sinusoid or a right a sinusoid function but there is orientation is fairly constant over a entire patch and rapidly transitions to some other orientation okay and uh, so you see these uh, sharp fairly sharp borders right between different pi orientation patches I mean, it's not completely smooth. The transition is somewhat uh, rapid. That is one thing. Another thing that's even more peculiar about this kind of a mapping is there are points where a lot of colors meet. You can see that, right? And uh, so that means around that point, you have. Uh, so if you think of uh, these colored patches as countries, right? There are points where a lot of countries meet. Right? There's like junction points. now which means if you go around that point quickly you will go through lots of countries that means you will cover a whole range of orientations you will cover a full spectrum of full range of orientations from 0 to 180 degrees so these kinds of points are called pinwheels so now there is no correspondence to any of this uh, stuff in your uh, cnns right in cnn so you have orientation sensitivity but uh, at least i've never heard of people discover discovering pinwheel kind of features in you know in hidden layers of a cnn maybe if you have very large uh, feature maps and if you analyze uh, carefully you might find but i don't have never heard of people saying uh, such pinwheels exist in in cnn <coughs> okay 
So in addition, there's one more interesting feature that you see in the primary visual cortex, which is that. So if you remember, right? Uh, if you remember how <clears throat> information from the two eyes has gone to uh, to two brains. So this is my let's say left eye, right eye. So this is left V1 and right V1. Okay, so you know that uh, right visual field goes here and here, right? And uh, so, so both from here and here, fibers go to the left visual, left, left visual cortex. Okay, which means a, a given area in LV1, left V1, will receive inputs from both left eye and right eye because it's trying to combine all informations coming from that given part of the visual cortex, right? Uh, so now the question is, there are several possibilities. Uh, the single neurons receive inputs from both uh, left eye and right eye, or do these uh, fibers project separately to different eyes? That means there are certain eyes Certain neurons which respond to only left eye inputs, certain neurons respond to only right eye inputs, right? But both present in in the in the same left part of the V1. Is that how it is? So it turns out that in early stages of development, when the baby is just born, right, and eyes are still getting adjusted, the brain is still trying to figure out how to respond to the visual stimulus, visual information coming from the world. The neurons of V1 respond to both eyes. But after a development, certain kind of maturation takes place and a lot of learning takes place. And neurons start becoming specialized in responding to eyes. That is, you'll find neurons that respond to only left eye and neurons respond to only right eye. So some kind of a competition occurs between neurons and they say, okay, look, you know, what's the point in both of us responding to both eyes, right? And we'll get confused, right? So I'll respond to the left eye, you respond to the right eye. So these guys are close to each other, but they figure out they kind of have an arrangement that uh, one guy responds left eye, one guy responds right eye. So therefore, you can see that in a mature uh, brain, right? If you record from the neurons, you'll find that there are, you'll find a patch if you again horizontally, you know, kind of uh, move and analyze the responses. You'll find that you'll have a bunch of neurons respond to right eye. And then right next to that, if you go further, you'll find a bunch of neurons responding to the left eye. Again, after that, you'll find right eye, again after that, left eye. Okay, so there is a very nice patterning of uh, an alternate uh, patches of right eye neurons and left eye neurons. And with the almost strict periodicity. I mean, it's, it's beautiful how, you know, a biological system, which is generally so messy, can come up with such orderly maps Right of any you know, of input stimulus, and people used to think that you know it's all genetics and everything is there in genes, but it's not quite true, right? These kinds of maps evolve and develop as a function of uh, the the excitation or the input stimulus coming from the visual world, and because of certain learning mechanisms that are in place. What genetics controls is the learning mechanisms, and the actual patterning happens because by by the drive coming from the visual input. So if you mess up your visual, visual input, or if you manipulate and artificially control your visual input, you can mess up these maps. So it's not in the genes, it's in, it's all in the learning mechanisms. So this picture that you are seeing, uh, seeing is only for uh, in one dimension. So if you like, just like in previous case, we go in one dimension, then you will see a simple alternation between right eye, right eye neurons and left eye neurons. But if you, if you probe it in two dimensions, the patterns look much more exciting. Okay, so the black and white patches that you see here uh, correspond to these zebra stripe like patterns. Uh, correspond to these left eye and right eye neurons. So if you, you can think of, if you think of black as left eye and you know, then white is right eye. Okay, it's, uh, um, now the, what is interesting is even such rich uh, and very biologically, uh, very organic looking uh, patterns can be explained by very simple computation models. Basically what is happening is there's some kind of a competition going on between neighboring neurons. Each neuron is trying to fight for an eye, okay? They want to get one eye. They want to get, become specialized, become, uh, you know, achieve some kind of a monopoly over one eye. So, so, there's, so, so neighboring neurons win the competition in such a way that 
if a is uh, becomes gets a monopoly of left eye then this neighbor b will get a monopoly of right eye okay so the very simple mechanisms are under play you know under, uh, under underlying this kind of a phenomena it looks complicated but underlying mechanisms are very simple so the people have shown this using simulations there's a lot of uh, work on that and uh but again the, there is no correspondence to this in zn and so the thing is you need to then even if you want to study possible presence of this kind of ocular dominance so these maps are called ocular dominance maps they also have columnar structure therefore they are called ocular dominance columns uh so in it's if you want to study these kinds of uh, maps and see if they possibly emerge in a cnn you need to have a cnn which has two images you need to have you don't you can't just give one image you need to give two images as inputs this is like your left retina and and a right retina <clears throat> and then give these two inputs to your you know your feature maps and things like that i can have multiple feature maps maybe if you train a cnn like that you might find ocular dominance columns but i don't know of any studies that have done that and also these two images cannot be just two random images you need to make sure because if you look at the retinal images the two retina have almost the same images but with a slight shift right because if i see an object right uh, from a certain vantage point that its object is here so this goes to the aperture here and produces a you know image here and uh, this goes to the aperture here and produces images here so in the two retina right the the image of this object will fall at a slightly different location there is a small shift which is called disparity so you need to construct actually those kinds of images right so there are softwares that will let you make these kinds of images in a virtual reality kind of simulation so you need to create such images in tena cnn and, and then see if uh, ocular dominance you know um, apps form you interesting study uh, but i haven't seen anything like that uh, that is tried so the other features of uh, ocular dominance and orientation uh, and sensitivity um, for example so people have found how these two maps are related because we said that in in the same b1 you have both orientation orientation sensitivity and ocular dominance now the question is uh, how do they how are they related with respect to each other so that is given by uh, certain properties so the ocular dominance uh, changes continuously as a function of cortical location so that is basic, very simple then ocular dominance pattern is locally organized into parallel strips right and we have seen that so these zebra stripe like patterns right if you look at a small local strip you know you find them as like okay, parallel strips now uh, but what is interesting is <clears throat> iso orientation slabs often cross the borders of the ocular dominance bands at approximately 90 right angles or 90 degrees what does that mean iso orientation slabs okay so so thing is if you look at uh, orientation so you see that uh, you have this sudden change in orientation so if you take this red region and yellow region this is this border between these two okay and along that border the orientation is fixed is same it is transition but it is kind of same so at these borders and these white lines are borders of the uh, ocular dominance maps okay so the iso orientation uh, lines or slabs often cross the borders of ocular dominance bands at approximately 90 degrees which you can see very often okay so you can see that uh, quite often the approximately they are crossing at 90 degrees okay so, so that is one in one interesting feature uh, that relates to these two kinds of maps the second thing is uh, the singularities these are nothing but what we call the pinwheels that is points in the orientation maps where a lot of colors meet that is a lot of around the neighborhood of these points there are a lot of orientations right you have cells which respond to all sorts of orientations so these singularities or pinwheels tend to align with the center of the ocular dominance bands so the white lines are, are the borders of the ocular dominance bands 
So if you look at pinwheels, uh, let us find some good pinwheels. And that's a very good pinwheel. You see that it's roughly in the center of this band. It's not perfectly so, but it's roughly in the center. Uh, let us pick some more. This one. Okay, kind of in the center. Uh, take this one. It's kind of in the center. Okay, so uh, so that is another property that relates the ocular dominance uh, maps and orientation sensitivity maps. So then people also have found another uh, feature. These are called blobs, and for want of a better term, so basically these are cells where there is no orientation sensitivity, but they respond to color. Uh, these kinds of cells are typically found in layers two and three of V1. <coughs> <clears throat> so okay, this is how the blob regions look. So roughly in a way, and so we said that you know if you remember those in the plot before, where if you probe the cortex vertically, you find you don't respond to the same orientation, but you find some some locations where uh, there is not much sensitivity to orientation. Okay, so these are the blob regions. Right where their neurons respond to color and not orientation. So they are just shown in this schematic. Okay, so they respond to color, and these these uh, region, these blobs are about uh, 0.2 millimeters in diameter. That's about 200 microns. So this uh, kind of account, whatever we have you know, studied so far, gives rise to a concept of what is called a hyper column. So that means uh, basically it's saying that uh, in a given cortical area in, in V1, in a given neighborhood, you have neurons that respond to lots of orientations. You have neurons that respond to left eye versus right eye. And you have neurons that, uh, that respond to different colors, right? So now, uh, so ideally speaking, right, what are the, so these cells are doing their, their bit, their, whatever they are trained for, whatever they are designed for. So in any given part of the visual field, Right, you may want to understand if there is any oriented line there, if there is any colored, you know, feature there, uh, and also you want to understand, you want to analyze that uh, stimulus, respond to the stimulus, whether it comes via your left eye or right eye, because uh, the left eye and right eye response to response to left eye and right eye, and the need to bring them together in one part in one cortical location, uh, is motivated by the need to extract depth. So basically, when you by combining the two retinal images, you can extract depth. Okay, so if you want to find out the depth of a given object, right? You want to see, uh, you can compare the images of that object in both the retinae, right? And by that comparison, you can extract depth. So therefore, you need to bring uh, both these locations, both these images of the retina inside the retina, uh, to the same cortical location to be able to compare them and find out what the depth is. So all this must be done in every part of the visual cortex. So there is this concept of hyper column, which says that there's a small stretch of about one millimeter by one millimeter, one millimeter square, inside which you have neurons that respond to left eye inputs and right eye inputs. Okay, neurons which respond to the full range of orientation sensitivity. And you have neurons which respond to all full set of colors. So you'll have a bunch of blobs. So that's like a basic functional unit, right, uh, of the visual cortex. And the same theme repeats. So it's like, you know, you can think of the visual cortex as uh, kind of a mosaic. I and mean, this is not a rectangular grid, but I'm just uh, saying it for the sake of uh, just you know, giving a simple explanation. So think of visual cortex as a mosaic. And each tile inside the mosaic, I have a bunch of orientation, uh, orientation sensitivity. Uh, ocular dominance and color. So you have neurons that respond to all possible colors, all possible orientations, and to both eyes. Okay, so so once you have that, that's like a complete suite, right? A complete set of neurons which can do all the processing necessary uh, to uh, necessary on a given part of the visual field. And the same theme is repeated over and over again over the entire visual cortex. Okay, so uh, so then we can go to higher cortical areas. I think uh, let us take a break here. Let us continue this uh, in the next class. And after that, uh, 
we'll apply uh, simple CNN models to certain aspects of the you know, visual function, right? And see how even simple models can explain a lot of uh, observations that you can make uh, on the visual system. So thanks a lot and see you on Friday.